Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that the format this year for the Family Cafe is very different than what we've had in the past. And I am so glad that our team is uh, able to uh, be here at least with you this way and share with you some things that are going on at ACC. You know, Lori Fahey and her entire team have worked so hard to bring this to you this year. So there is a lot that you can participate in, and I hope you will. But I really miss seeing you. I see miss seeing your sweet, wonderful faces and the questions that you always have that are so good. And you're you're still going to be able to ask questions and send them in to us because that's the way we can communicate right now. Unfortunately, things are very different now. Um, but it's a new normal, and but at least we can talk like this. Um, so, again, I really miss seeing you, and hopefully your loved ones are – are, are well and you are well uh, this is a just a terrible time for everybody with this this pandemic that we're all dealing with uh, and I'm by the way speaking to you from home in fact all of us are we're staying home and being very careful doing the things we're supposed to do you know I went out one time and I wore my mask I wore my gloves I stayed away from people but I saw that a lot of other people were not doing that and that's one of the things I want to talk to you about today, the responsibility that we all have about staying home. Because, you know, this enemy that we have is invisible. And so we must, this is our job, we must stay home and make sure that we take care of our loved ones and ourselves. You know, I am so proud of the direct care workers, the individuals that go into the group homes, that go into our facilities, that, that go into homes to provide services. These are our frontline uh, folks. They are our frontline responders. They are heroes. They're wonderful, these providers that are doing this. They wear their masks. They do the things they're supposed to do. They have their temperatures taken. They are they're absolute heroes, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for all of the work that they do. Um, you know, all of us are working hard to try to make sure that we can get through this challenge. It is a very difficult time for everyone. So I want to say a big thank you to the providers out there and to the individuals that are helping to keep people safe. Um, you know, we've had a busy year this week, by the way. Um, several months back, we celebrated Dis Developmental Disabilities Day at the Capitol. And do you know that was only February? That's just so hard for me to believe, but we've had two and a half, three months of very difficult times, especially for families that are having to stay in, and especially for those that have not been able to see their families, and I know how hard that is, because I have three grandchildren that I have not been able to see, and actually for a month before this even started, and my son, I'm not able to see them either. And it is so painful to not be able to see the ones you love. But I know that it is important for me to do my job. And my job right now, because I'm over 65 and I have an autoimmune disease, I can't go out. And a lot of you are in the same situation. So please remember that attitude is really important through all of this because we can't see this enemy. enemy. But today we're going to share with you some of the things that – we have been doing at the agency that I think are really important to you. Um, for example, Karen Hagen and Lynn Dahl are going to share with you what we've been doing to protect our customers and providers that deal with the COVID um, terrible virus that's out there. Ed DeBarbalaven and Tom Rice are going to talk with you about the QSI, as you know of it. It's now been changed to, co and we call it Individual Comprehensive Assessment or ICA, because it is so fantastic. They've done so much work, uh, and it's going to be a much better assessment for all of you. 
Chi Lamont uh, is going to give you an update on how things are going uh, with iConnect. I know a lot of you uh, are wanting to ask questions and have asked questions. That's our client data management system that we've been spending several years on to get it ready for all of the providers to have a better and more efficient system, but more importantly, for you to be able to see information that you haven't been able to in the past. We still have a year or so to go on that, but we're making great progress, and you're going to hear about that. Stephanie Rogers is also going to talk with you about the, the resources that you have. You all know about them, but she's going to tell you more about the things that we've been doing to make them even better. So you're going to hear all about that. So right now, let me turn it over to Karen Hagen. I'll be back at the end to have a, a few things at the end, but Karen Hagen is going to now uh, give you a status update on COVID-19 and the current challenges, and then she will turn it over to Lynn. So take it away, Karen. Thank you, Director. Hello, everyone. As the Director said, we're all being affected by COVID-19 in different ways. We're facing challenges we've never faced before and having to solve problems we've never had to solve before. As APD's Emergency Coordination Officer, I want to share with you what we've been doing to protect our consumers and providers. Every state agency, like APD, has representatives who come together at the State Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee to coordinate and collaborate to solve the problems of Florida citizens. Uh, working together proves essential to the survival of our clients. And our responsibility to you, all of our responsibility to you, our consumers, our providers, our families, and our staff, this public health emergency called upon us all to provide protections in a whole new way. Um, APD has had two to three representatives of the State Emergency Operations Center every day since the inception of this event, which is well over 80 days ago. As issues are raised up from around the state, we work with our state agency partners like ACA and DCF and the Department of Health and the Department of Elder Affairs and the Department of Economic Opportunity and the Division of Emergency Management, et cetera, to solve problems. Education about the virus and precautions about how to access PPE, the personal protective equipment that we've all heard about so much and assisting our regional leadership and connecting with the local health departments and emergency management agencies has been critical in helping our consumers, our providers, our group homes, our waiver support coordinators, and our families get through these challenging times. I know you've heard a lot about PPE, about testing, about contact tracing. These three things are key to protecting ourselves and those we care about and care for. And they will continue to be critically important in the days, weeks, and even months to come. As you know, the state, our nation, the world has suffered with the scarcity of PPE. And when we speak about that, I'm really talking about masks, gloves, and face shields. When everyone was needing PPE, the Department of Health and Emergency Management were able to supply, even locally, uh, and for every county, uh, those who needed it the most. Now, thankfully, PPE is again available in the marketplace. And we need to stay the course and continue to wear masks to protect ourselves and those we care about. The good news is that masks work. Testing has been a top priority for our governor, for the Surgeon General, for the rest of our state leaders. Over 900,000 tests have been performed in Florida, and testing will continue throughout our state. At this time, the positivity rate from these tests overall is less than 4%, which is good news. The availability and conduction of tests has touched us all. We have drive through and walk-up testing sites throughout the state of Florida, and the location of these public test sites can be found on the APD or the Department of Health websites in the COVID-19 section. Our APD website has a, a lot of wonderful information about um, COVID-19, and I would encourage you to check that out. Also, our providers and our I have been working with our regional operation managers um, locally throughout the state. Um, and with the county health departments to track and test our group home residents. A lot of work has been done in that, in that area. Hand in hand with testing is contact tracing. Our, con our county health departments and their epidemiologists 
have tried to trace those individuals who have tested positive to know where they've been or traveled to or who they've come in contact with to try to slow down and ultimately stop the spread of COVID-19. We're going to continue to work with our state agency partners as decisions are made on relaxing restrictions. These decisions should be made with careful review of a number of factors. And because the pandemic is affecting communities in different ways, our state and local leaders are regularly monitoring the factors for reopening and adjusting theirs and our plans accordingly. Staying the course, as the director said, wearing masks, getting tested, practicing social distancing, washing our hands, staying home as much as possible continues to be our best defense against COVID-19. And our APD team remains diligent and we will stay the course alongside of you. And with that, I will turn it over to Lynn Daw, our Chief of Provider Supports. Thank you so much, Karen. It is so great to uh, be able to talk with all of you today. I really just wanted to expand on some of the information that Karen has provided to you and talk to you more specifically about some of the agency's activities as it relates to COVID-19. Um, this pandemic has affected each one of us on a very personal basis, the way we live our lives, the way that we conduct our work activities. And I just wanted to assure you that all of us at the agency realize beyond how you're dealing with the pandemic on a personal basis, just how especially hard it is for those of you who have family members who may live in an APD licensed home and you've not been able to visit them, or perhaps you have family members who live at home with you, but their daily routine has been completely disrupted. They've not been able to go to their ABT program. They've not been able to go out with their companion provider and do fun activities. Um, perhaps they're still in school and school was closed early. And so their routine has been completely disrupted. Early on in the pandemic, APD and the Agency for Healthcare Administration have worked very closely together to look at the ways that we as state agencies could lessen the impact that this pandemic causes. Uh, we knew right off that there would be a lot of impact on the providers um, in the way that they typically render services and how those can be rendered, while at the same time making sure that we keep people safe. And we also knew that providers would be financially impacted because some of their programs have had to close down or it has not been safe for them to render services as they normally have. So early in the process, the agency, along with the Agency for Healthcare Administration, requested flexibilities in some of our waiver services to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of those flexibilities and how those impact the providers. Those flexibilities include how services are rendered and where services are rendered. And one of the most important flexibility was that providers of certain services, such as adult day training and residential habilitation, have been able to receive retainer payments which allow the provider to uh, keep their employees home so they don't have to worry about being without a job while getting income coming into these provider organizations. And that has been so beneficial for their purposes. Um, one of the other flexibilities is also that certain services, your therapy services, your OTTT speech, specialized mental health counseling and behavior analysis services are able to be rendered via telemedicine, meaning that the person can still receive these much needed services while the therapist is rendering those services in a safe manner via phone and video. So that has been very helpful as well. Uh, the director had talked about our providers and really how they've been impacted through this process and that they are heroes, and that is very true. And when we look at our group home operators especially, they have very challenging jobs because they have ultimate responsibility for keeping people safe, and they've really
really done an amazing job. Uh, APD has provided guidance to our providers, consistent with the guidance of the Centers for Disease Control, uh, the Department of Health, and guidance from the governor's office. And of course, one of those guidances is that at the present time, for people that are living in our licensed home, we are unable to allow visitors into the home. That's consistent with how nursing homes and assisted living facilities also are impacted currently. And we realize that that is so hard for each of you who really want to have an opportunity to visit with your family members. And we also know that given the people we serve, it may be difficult for them to understand why it is not possible for you to visit during this time. We've worked closely with the group homes to come up with creative ways to keep that contact going, whether it's phone calls or video conferencing with you. And just know that as an agency, we recognize how challenging that is. The governor's office recognizes that. And as soon as it is safe for those visits to reoccur, we will make sure that our providers know that and that you know that so that so that you can continue that process. And so critically important. We've also started working with developing some protocols for our providers so that when those visit restrictions can be lifted, those visits can occur in a safe manner. Um, as you can imagine, as we've seen businesses starting to open up, I'm sure if you've uh, been able to get out from your home, you might see that we've got restaurants opening up, some stores are opening up. We're starting to get, as you can imagine, a lot of questions from our providers about when it's safe to take people out into community to conduct activities. Um, at this point, based on the governor's phase in plan, we've instructed providers that right now they really need to limit these outings. When you think about the people that we serve as an agency, many of the folks fall into one of those high risk categories. It may not be based on age, but it may be based on underlying health conditions. And the governor's recommendations are quite clear that those people that fall into high risk categories really need to limit their community activities. However, we know that as we continue to see um, from a reduction in the number of new cases, that those opportunities are just around the corner. So as a result, we're working on developing some protocols for our providers so that they can use in keeping people safe and being able to access those activities. Um, and as you can imagine, we're starting to also get quite a few questions from our adult day training providers about when they'll be able to reopen. Uh, we have asked each of those closed adult day training programs who are considering reopening to submit their plans for reopening to the region for review. And it will be, of course, critical as these decisions are being made to reopen these settings that the provider is able to ensure the health and safety of people that attend and making sure, for example, that they have bathroom sanitation protocols that, as Karen has said, they have proper personal protection equipment for the um, providers as well as the individuals to attend those programs, that they're able to practice social distancing standards. And one of the things we also need to consider when the adult day training programs are opening up is how people can be safely transported to the program while maintaining proper social distancing. So again, we're working as an agency in developing some protocols and also reviewing those plans from the ADT provider standpoint. We've gotten quite a few questions, as you can imagine. We all have questions about COVID-19. And as an agency, we have included the questions that we're getting as well as the answers on our website. And we just encourage you when you have an opportunity to go to our website, and we have a specific section on COVID-19, and there you can find those frequently asked questions and the answers that we've given. Again, we just appreciate all that you do and your patience as we navigate through 
uh, these uncharted waters, which are COVID-19. So thank you for allowing us to be with you today. Thank you, Karen and Lynn. Um, very, very important message, and uh, I hope all of you uh, have learned something. I know there's uh, a lot going on out there, and I know you have a lot of questions, and we do encourage you to send those questions to us. Uh, and But right now, thank you again, Karen and Lynn. Tom Rice and Ed DeBarbalaven are going to talk with you about the individual comprehensive assessment. Uh, which the agency has been working very hard uh, in the last year or so uh, to do this. So, uh, Tom, you want to uh, give them an overview? You and Ed? Certainly. Um, the, uh, it, it, we're, we're very excited to, to talk about rolling out our new client needs assessment called the Individual Comprehensive Assessment, as Director Palmer said, or, or the ICA. Um, it will be replacing our current needs assessment, which is the QSI, or Questionnaire for Situational Information. Um, now, why are, are we doing this? Some people might ask. Why, what, what's wrong with the QSI? Well, nothing is wrong with the QSI, the current needs assessment. It's actually a, um, a very good uh, needs assessment tool. It's just with, with any client needs assessment, it, it's important um, over time to, to pay attention to, to the results and listen to the feedback from the people who are um, not only administering the needs assessment tool, but also, more importantly, the people, um, the, the clients and families who, who are, are um, being assessed. Um, we just need to ensure that the tool is, is, um, is really measuring uh, everything we need to know uh, about an individual and, and their specific needs. And so that's what we did. Um, with, with several years of experience with the QSI under our belts, um, we were able to, um, to pay attention to, to what kinds of things um, uh, that, that we felt could be improved. With the needs assessment tool, and um, I feel very confident that the the ICA, the Individual Comprehensive Assessment, um, is going to allow us to to capture much more information about each client's uh, needs uh, in in terms of their their um, their behavioral needs, their health needs, their physical needs. Um, one of the benefits of the ICA, it actually, for the very first time, really captures a lot of good detailed information about caregivers. Um, so we can, you know, uh, have information about those, the, the, the age, the health status of caregivers that will help us in, in, in planning um, for, for future needs of individuals. Now, the specific purposes of the, the ICA, um, because it is, um, it does provide us with a, a great deal more information than the QSI. It will allow us to, um, to achieve uh, uh, certain purposes. Uh, first off, uh, we really will allow us to identify um, all the support uh, a person would need uh, to allow them to, to remain living in the community. Uh, at some point in the future, it will allow us to, um, to use the information about an individual's needs for resource allocation. When, when, when budgets are being established, we'll, it will be, those budgets will, will be um, uh, aligned with what the individual's support needs are. Um, it will provide um, APD with, with alerts if there are certain areas that, that uh, it is determined that there's a risk of harm to the individual, um, APD will automatically be alerted about those issues for, for subsequent follow-up. Um, it will also assess a person's level of social integration. Um, our goal is really to make sure individuals are um, not just in the community, but are actually a part of the community and really looking at, um, you know, what their level of, of, um, of uh, involvement in the community is, which is very important. Uh, and finally, it will allow us to, to, um, to aggregate data, to look at data on a statewide basis that will help us in planning. So we'll know um, what, what's, what's coming down the road in terms of um, 
you know, the, the, the needs of our clients, aging caregivers, et cetera. So that's also a very important uh, uh, component of the ICA that will allow us to do that. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ed DeBartolese. Ed is our, our bureau chief of our quality management management section, and Ed's going to give a little bit more detail about the tool um, and how we're going to be uh, rolling it out. I'll turn it over to you now, Ed. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, actually, at first, we have been working diligently on enhancing the assessment process. Now, one of the things that's really nice about this new tool is that it will be automated, and it will help us to get uh, live data on the assessment results and will enable us to communicate to those individuals who use a follow-up on the uh, alerts that may have been identified, as well as help in support planning. Uh, in addition to the tool being automated, we have uh, a consultant working with us to help us uh, in the area of instructional design to uh, develop, develop training and certification of ATD staff to administer the tool. And during the month of June, July, uh, the assessors that we have, who are currently two assessors, will be going through training and certification to administer the new tool. It's important to note that only those individuals who have successfully passed the certification will be eligible to administer the individual comprehensive assessment tool. After the conclusion of the assessment, excuse me, that is the training and certification, uh, depending upon uh, the pandemic of being lifted, the assessors will be uh, re going out and doing assessments of over a thousand individuals throughout the state to, to look at the integrator reliability and, and making sure that the task or assessment is doing what it's intended to do. And so uh, individuals, many of whom will be you who are uh, listening today, will be contacted to see about participating in the assessment uh, process. Uh, based upon the conclusion of the uh, assessment process, which we hope will be con uh, to conclude by the end of the fall, again, depending upon uh, the lifting of the uh, pandemic, uh, that is the COVID-19 virus, and enabling us to come and visit the people, we will be uh, compiling the data results uh, and then forwarding it over to Florida State University to conduct the reliability and validity study. Uh, they will be looking to make sure that all of the questions are uh, meeting the expected needs to better help us to better serve you. Uh, at the conclusion of the reliability validity study, we will be getting a report from them, uh, as well as looking at the results of the feedback we get from assessors and you to find out if the tool is meeting uh, your expectations. Uh, that will lead to a uh, further uh, uh, review in that we will be looking at uh, resource allocation methodology, depending upon uh, the results of the successful uh, study of the uh, assessment tool. Uh, our goal is that we will be implementing the new tool in 2022, uh, depending upon uh, the uh, results of the study and, and, and so forth. So um, that's basically the summary of the implementation of the individualized uh, comprehensive assessment tool. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom and Ed. Um, I just want to say one thing. Probably of all the things 
that we do in this agency, and we do a lot of things uh, to provide services for the individuals to you and your loved ones. But this is probably the single most important thing, and the reason is because it's the foundation, the absolute foundation that assesses each individual person's needs. It's not about throwing everybody into a bucket and treating everybody the same. No, this is an individual assessment so that we, and it's much more sophisticated than it was. It, of course, it was a very good, the QSI was a very good assessment, but this is absolutely going to be statistically valid, um, and it will really go into detail uh, about what is the individual's need, what is going on in their life right now, what's going on in their family's life right now, so that we can make sure that what we're getting you is what you need. So thank you so much, Tom and Ed, and I just, a special shout out to Ed uh, and the team that he's put together, these consultants, just done a phenomenal job on this. So thank you so much, Tom and Ed. Now let's turn to Sheila, who is another uh, individual that has done just heroic work uh, on iConnect. Um, Sheila is the one that's leading the charge on all of our training. Uh, Lisa Robertson has taken the lead along with our IT, Shalom, uh, to make sure that we're working with our consultants to get this very, very important um, system in place, which, by the way, this system is a system that not only uh, will help providers in, and authorizations immediately for services for people, but down the line, it's also going to be a vehicle for you to be able to find out more about what's going on in your life or what's going on in your loved one's life uh, as far as uh, services are concerned. So, uh, Sheila, let me turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, thank you, Director Palmer, and hello to everyone. Uh, it, it has been an exciting year for the APDI Connect team, and um, we really look forward to this opportunity to come and speak to you every year and just bring you up to date on what's been happening behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. This year is, has shown a lot of activity and things that you'll be able to to, or you might hear about from your support coordinators, your providers in the near future are things like the waiver support coordinators will be starting to do your person-centered support plan in APDI Connect. And so that's where all of your information will be stored and, and shared with, with the providers that, that provide your services and supports. So that's one of the biggest exciting benefits to the APDI Connect system to you as consumers and, and family members of consumers is that for the first time in the history of this agency, our support coordinators and providers and our APD staff will be able to share one system and improve the overall communication as people work together with you to coordinate your services and supports. And, and as you know, that person-centered support plan, that, that is the hub for you in terms of driving all of your services and supports. So we're very excited to be bringing that online. Our other really big um, milestone this year is that we are starting to do our training for providers. And as you know from, from other years when we've talked to, together about the implementation schedule, it is a staggered implementation or a rolling implementation schedule where not all of the providers will start using APDI Connect at the same time, um, but rather it will be based upon services or, or procedure codes you might hear people reference. The services that have been identified for implementation this year are respite services and personal support services. So your providers of those two services are already starting to receive their training for APDI Connect and how to use the system and how to communicate with your waiver support coordinator. And um, that, that has been a very exciting event for us and our training team. And one of the changes that we did have to make this year based upon the, the COVID-19 pandemic is we did go ahead and change to a virtual training platform. And so 
or we're not able to do it face to face with the providers, but I can share with you that we are getting some good responses from the providers. They're excited about this system. They want to learn more about this system. And you'll probably hear them talking about it as they start to use APDI Connect. Uh, the primary reason that we, we identified respite and personal supports as the services to, to start with in APDI Connect is that we are also going to, later this year, implement electronic visit verification. We call it EVV for short. And what electronic visit verification does is the person who comes out to see you, they will log into a system to note geographically where they are using the GPS on their device, a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop. But it is in response to a, a federal mandate with the um, 21st Century Cures Act to ensure that certain services delivered, intended to be delivered in the consumer's home are, are being delivered in the consumer's home and, and to help reduce any, any kind of occurrence of fraud or those kinds of things. So that is being implemented this year and our respite and personal supports providers will begin using our APDI Connect EVV or electronic visit verification system um, starting later this year. And, and again, that's just very exciting for us. And so far, the providers are, are also looking forward to using, using it. In the future, we, we have, we'll be rolling out for additional services in the, in, you know, next year. But these are the services that are identified for this year. And again, we just wanted to share that with you because you may hear your support coordinators or your providers talking about it. And we do have information available on our iConnect page on our website. So I encourage all individuals and their family members to go ahead and, and check that out because there's always updates being added to that. And Director, in a nutshell, that's where we are with APD iConnect. Well, uh, Sheila, just take another minute, if you would, because I think that um, one of the things that, that you didn't mention, and I think it's important, and that is that we have another group of heroes out there, and that's our waiver support coordinators, which, quite frankly, have already gone through this training and uh, are, are, are on the front lines out there making sure everybody is okay. And I, let me just make this one other comment. For, for providers out there that are listening, I feel your pain when it comes to learning a new IT system. I'm telling you, since I've had to work from home, I've had to learn, I can't tell you how much uh, IT. I mean, getting online with Teams, with SharePoint, with this, with that, when my, when my computer goes down and all of this, it is so hard for some people. For some people, it's very easy. But for other people, it's hard. So I understand change, especially changing with technology is hard. But it will be worth it. It will be worth it in the long run. We will have an incredible system that will provide not just communication, as, as Sheila pointed out, but absolute accurate data, accurate information that's going back and forth so we can make sure that we're giving you uh, and the providers, all that they need, the tools they need to be the best they can be in the services they're providing you. But Sheila, if you just mentioned just a little bit about the WSDs, because they went through a lot of training. Yes, they did. Um, actually, the, the waiver support coordinators have had multiple in-person sessions as we've introduced newer functionalities and in preparing them for every new edition that, that goes online with APD iConnect. And um, they are very responsive to all of the things. They can see the potential that APD iConnect will bring for them. And one of the other things that will be happening this year, and, and, your, and our waiver support coordinators are going to be leading that charge, is we are in the process of transitioning the cost planning system from the iBudget system to the APD iConnect system. Again, integrating everything into one place. And, and that will help them better be able to coordinate those services with the, the goals and the needs identified in that person-centered support plan. They will also become, um, you know, as, as we start introducing 
providers into using APDI Connect, I'm sure that they'll be working closely with those providers as folks get used to that transition. So what we're doing, and again, with, with the support coordinators kind of leading that charge for us, is we are tightening um, that, that circle of supports for the individuals that, that we all mutually serve and, and bringing everyone together into this one hub of information and data. And as you said, just being able to provide accurate data and um, what providers and support coordinators and, and you, the individuals and the families, what you all need, it's, it's just so exciting for us. And so, yes, we, we thank our, our waiver support coordinators for all that they've done so far to help us get ready to bring the providers on board and are just looking forward to seeing how, how the relationships among support coordinators, providers, and the individuals and their families just evolves from this. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. You know, um, this is Barbara again. I, uh, you know, I really see all of us. And I mean each one of you that's listening, uh, and that includes providers, our APD staff, the individuals we serve, their families. We're one family. We're one big family. And what we're trying to do is to give you all the tools that you're going to need to be able to thrive in your life. That's what all of this is about. It's not just about getting through the day. It's not just about you know, giving you services. It's about giving you opportunity to be the best you can be. And and that's what we're trying to do every day. And so thank you, Sheila, and everyone that's spoken so far. But now Stephanie is going to talk with you about, I know you know about the resource directory and you, you probably know about the other tools that we have, but I'm going to let Stephanie, uh, please, she, she's the one that keeps everything up to date. Uh, so Stephanie, if you would please... Uh, talk to people about these very important resources that we have. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Today I'd like to share with you two web-based tools that our agency created in hopes of helping individuals and families with researching state programs, as well as connect them with resources in their local communities. You can find the links to these two databases on our agency's website at appcares.org. If you scroll down to about center of the home page, you'll find two quick link boxes for our Florida Navigator and our Community Resource Directory. The Florida Navigator was designed to assist families with researching government programs available through the state of Florida and include information from our sister agencies, such as the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Department of Children and Families, Department of Education, Department of Elder Affairs, uh, Department of Health, Transportation, as well as our agency. This web-based tool was designed with a lifespan approach to allow users to sort through the program by life stages. We have four life stages in the Florida Navigator. We have early years for programs for children under the age of three, school years for programs for students ages four to 21, work and family years for programs for individuals ages 22 to 59, and retirement years for programs for individuals over the age of 60. When you use the Florida Navigator, the search results provide you with the program name, the agency responsible for oversight for that program, eligibility requirements, program costs, a direct link to the agency's website with additional details for that program, and an agency contact telephone number. We also wanted to provide um, users with an opportunity to connect with a peer or a family experiencing a similar journey. So we partnered with our Family Care Councils, which is a group of governor-appointed volunteers who serve as advisors for our agency, as well as provide outreach and information to individuals with bowel disabilities and their families. They are a very knowledgeable group and will be able to help families with understanding some of the various state programs. You can submit your contact information on the Florida Navigator homepage, and a former Family Care Council representative from your local community will contact you. The second database that we have um, uh, is called our Community Resource Directory. This directory is created to help individuals to organize uh, to connect individuals to organizations that provide services within their local communities. Um, these are programs such as community respite programs, medical equipment training organizations, parent and advocacy training groups, 
successful sports, recreational programs, dental programs, so much more. There's so many organizations within our local communities that provide such great services. You can search by county or you can search for a resource within a certain, de- uh, certain distance from your zip code by using a zip code feature. The directory also has a number of statewide and national resources. The search results provides you with a description of the program, an age range for services provided, contact information, a website, and a Google map, which allows you to input your home address and get driving directions to the program location. The community resource directory also allows users and organizations to contribute to um, contribute resources to the directory. So if you know of a helpful organization in your community and notice it's not on our directory, please let us know. Click that Submit a New Resource button at the top of the page, and we will contact the organization to learn more about that program. The directory also features an events cal- calendar, which allows organizations to post information about various events held throughout the state, such as local job fairs, food distribution events, statewide and national training opportunities, and social events such as the Tim Tebow's Night to Shine. So we encourage you to stop by our homepage. Again, it's apdcares.org. Scroll down to the center, and there you will find the two quick link boxes for the Florida Navigator and the Community Resource Directory. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, We appreciate it. And, you know, Stephanie does a lot of work to keep this thing current. Uh, because you know, things are changing constantly. But uh, we want to make sure that you have the, the latest information. And one of the things that uh, I think especially the resource directory does is it provides you an opportunity to see resources that are in your area. And then once this pandemic is lifted, it also gives you resources if you want to go visit some other area of the state, and it will tell you what resources are available in those areas. So. These are very, very important um, uh, areas where you can get information about the state uh, and also about resources that are directly for you. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for all the work that you do. So um, thank everyone that was involved in all of this. And uh, before I close out, I'd like to ask Zoe, who is our uh, deputy uh, communications director, if she would please tell people where they can send their questions. I know that you have questions. We, when we do this in person, you guys have lots of questions. And actually, that's my favorite part because that's the way I learn about what you want and what you need and, and what you care about. So I really hope that you will send in questions. So Zoe, will you please tell them where they can send those questions? Certainly, if you have a question for us, uh, please email APD dot info at apdcares.org. Um, again, that's apd.info at apdcares.org. And if you'd like to learn more about APD, you can visit our website, apdcares.org. Um, we also, um, as is mentioned before, we have a good section about our efforts for COVID-19. Um, but if you have a specific question, you can email that email address. Okay, well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, you know, we have, by the way, many other presentations uh, at Family Cafe. And I want to again thank Lori Fahey and the entire board and team for continuing to put all this together. We have a lot of APD folks that are going to be doing other presentations. We have one on CDC Plus, uh, iConnect, more in depth information about iConnect, zero tolerance. Um, employment, uh, disaster preparedness, and recovery. There's just many, many things. And that's just the APD stuff. There's going to be a lot of other entertainment, uh, a lot of wonderful things that I hope that you all will tune into uh, for Family Cafe. And again, thank you, Lori Fahey and team, for, for doing this. Because we miss being together. But at least this is the second best thing. So thank you all so much. Let me just say a couple of things. Um, one is that it's really important that we all, and by we, I mean me too, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you, okay? It's hard. It's very, very hard to stay in. 
But, you know, through this pandemic, um, this virus is invisible. We've heard that. We've heard the fact that we have uh, an, an invisible enemy. And, and I'd like for you to visualize this, if you would. You know, out in the world, let's pretend we could see it. Let's pretend we could see that virus. And it's out there. And it's connected with some people, and it's not connected with others. But the thing is, right now, we don't know who it's connected to. But it's important that all of us in this process understand what our individual jobs are. If, if you are someone that is a first responder, your job is to go out in the world to help keep people safe. If you're a direct care worker and you're going into one of our facilities or into our group home or even into somebody's home, your job is to make sure you have all of the protective equipment, not just to protect the other people you're serving, but to protect yourself. Because if you get it, then the next person you go to could get it. You don't know where this little virus is hanging on. Where is it? But you can be carrying it with you wherever you go. And so that's their job. The rest of us, our job is to stay home, stay in until we have a vaccine or until we have something that can protect us. This is the reason why we say no visitation. It's not because we're trying to be mean. It's because if one person goes out or one person comes in to visit, it can, it can affect every single person in that home, the people working there as well as the other people. So it's important that we each know what our jobs are and that we, we do what we need to do. So with that, I, I just a couple of things. I, the one I, the area that I think is probably very hard for some of you, and that is those of you that actually do have jobs. You have jobs out there and you're not allowed to go do it. And I'm so sorry about that. The day will come when you'll be able to do that. It's just not right now. So we all have to have the right attitude. We have to have attitude is everything. And I mean everything in life. Even without this uh, horrible virus, attitude is what drives our day. You know, whether we're going to be in a good attitude, a bad attitude, or, or whatever, if everybody around you is affected by the attitude you have. So we all have a responsibility to have the right attitude. And I'm going to read something that someone just gave me from W.C. Fields. I don't know if all of you know who he is, but those of you that are in my generation, we certainly do. But he's a wise and very funny man, but very wise. He said, attitude is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than what people do or say. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. I totally agree with him. And let me leave with my very favorite quote that I use many times, that is from Robert Schuler. I don't know if you all know him, but tough times don't last, but tough people do. We all are responsible right now to be tough, hang in here, do what our jobs are, and stay the course. Stay the course. This virus is not gone. God bless you all. We love you. Stay safe. All right. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back. And thank you to the Agency for Persons with Disabilities and Barbara Palmer for that presentation. Uh, once again, APD is certainly there to answer your questions. I just want to repeat one more time the email address to contact APD. That's apd.info at apdcares.org. Or visit the website at apdcares.org. All right, so that brings us to the end of our programming here on Friday. What do we have going on tomorrow, Joe? Tomorrow, we have two more sessions, both of which are roundtables. At 11 a.m., we have the Autism Roundtable, and at 2 p.m., the Cerebral Palsy Roundtable.
All right. Well, roundtables are always popular yeah. at the in-person conference. It's a chance to connect and hear from other people that have a similar lived experience to yours. So we definitely hope you'll tune in for those two roundtable sessions tomorrow. And don't forget, Sunday is our day off, but we will be back right. on Monday morning at 11. Uh, I think we'd also like to thank our sponsors. So they include Career Source Florida, Disability Rights Florida, and Sunshine Health, and of course, Able United, who uh, Joe is gonna share a short message from them. Florida's qualified ABLE program is called ABLE United and allows you to save tax-free without impacting eligibility for public benefits like SSI or Medicaid. Join the thousands of account holders today. Plus when you enroll by June 30th using the promo code FAMILY75, you will receive a $75 contribution and an exclusive prize pack. Very cool. I like prizes. There you go. Speaking of prizes, remember, if you want a free gift, yeah. We have some available. Just complete the report card that lets us know how you're enjoying the event. It looks like this. And complete that. Was that upside down? It was, yes. wasn't it? That's it looks right. like this. I understand. And <laughs> the amount of times card. you've told them this, they yeah. do get it by you now. Tell them I every think time. you got it. Yeah. You might just watch yeah, one. Yeah, maybe. The pink card is filled that out too. Remember when you send those back, we need your return address to send you your free gifts. So don't forget to do that. All right. Well, that closes out our Friday, and we will see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. See you then. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.